I've become convinced that being a grad student in the humanities is evenly split between feeling like Who the frick cares about queering temporality? This is useless. This is never gonna help any queer person. And feeling like I think I may have just discovered how Have You Seen My Laptop by Brian David Gilbert accidentally changed the definition of cinema. So I'm in a master's program focusing on cinema and media studies. I'm actually doing my thesis on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I majored in English in college, and I naively decided to go into media studies for grad school because I thought I'd get to be like my favorite video essayists on YouTube. I'd analyze characters and plots and arguments, but instead of doing poetry, I'd get to focus on my favorite shows and movies and internet memes. But while that mix of close reading and cultural studies certainly exists in cinema and media studies, it seems like recently there's a lot more work being done on the technology that brings us the media than the content of the media itself. Wait, so you're trying to do all this close reading and scholars are still debating what cinema even is? Well. Yeah. One of the founding scholars in the field of cinema studies was Andre Bazin. Bazin believed that the thing that made photography and thus cinema unique, that made it grab our attention in a different way from any other art form, was its realism. Bazin thought that realism came from film's indexicality. Indexicality just means the thing you're seeing can only have been made in one specific way. Film, for example, is made when light reacts chemically with a film strip. So whatever the camera lens is pointing to is what you see. There's no room for human intervention. The aesthetic qualities of photography are to be sought in its power to lay bare the realities. It is not for me to separate off in the complex fabric of the objective world, here a reflection on a damp sidewalk, there the gesture of a child, only the impassive lens, stripping its object of all those ways of seeing it, those piled up preconceptions, that spiritual dust and grime with which my eyes have covered it, are able to present it in all its virginal purity to my attention and, consequently, to my love. And, I mean, who wouldn't want to present to Bazan's attention and thus his love? Look at him. He's sweet, dreamy, good with cats. But Bazan's theory of cinema as this ultimate indexical realism has caused a lot of consternation lately now that cinema has, you know, gone digital and can be manipulated with all sorts of CGI effects. Some scholars think that Bazan was right about film's unique indexicality and think that digital cinema really is something different. Lev Manovich thinks that digital is a lot closer to painting than to photography. What he calls the kino eye of the camera lens has been replaced by the kino brush of Adobe After Effects. He thinks we should lean into that. And he's created these things called soft cinema, little digital movies that kind of look like computerized collages. But some scholars think that Bazan was wrong. Tom Gunning points out that cinema was never indexical, even in the days before digital. Film could always be manipulated, airbrushed, brightened, darkened. He thinks we should focus more on animation, the way that cinema can create the illusion of motion. That's what he thinks makes cinema unique and worthy of paying attention to. He's coined the term cinema of attractions to describe how throughout cinema history, there's been this trend of trying to wow us with fast moving images on screen, almost as if we're riding a roller coaster. But here's what I think these debates are missing. I think that what makes us pay attention to cinema is not necessarily what's technologically unique about it. Just like podcasts, music, paintings, or any other art form, I think what matters to us about movies and videos is the meaning we make from them. And I kind of don't think the meaning is constructed just as the light from the screen is hitting our eyeballs. I think that the meaning making happens over time and often in conversation with other people. Okay, I think I get it. Scholars have based their definitions of cinema around tech, not meaning. So what are you going to do about it? Also, isn't this video supposed to be about Brian David Gilbert? Studying all these film theorists has taught me that academia is basically a big debate. If you don't like what someone is saying, you can tell people why you think they're wrong. 
You can also tell people if you think they're paying attention to the wrong thing. So today, I'm going to tell academics in cinema and media studies that if they want to figure out how viewers construct meaning from cinematic works, they need to consider the conversations that people are having around those works. That's right, I'm going to tell academics they need to study YouTube comments. I'm also going to show how some YouTube fan communities are doing the same kind of close reading and synthesis that a lot of academics use in their work. And I'm going to do all this by discussing the three-minute musical comedy video Have You Seen My Laptop by Brian David Gilbert. Have You Seen My Laptop? starts with Karen asking her roommate, Brian, Have you seen my laptop? Yeah, maybe. What is a laptop? It's a small computer. You can you have one right in front of you. Oh, yes. It's right here. No, my laptop. Uh, no, you don't have one, though. That's what I'm s And when she presses him, things just get more mysterious. Come gather round and I'll tell you a tale. Are we ready? A tale of a night very much like the one to Brian launches into a 12-verse ballad that's too long for a three-minute video. Never mind, I'll come back later. I'll skip to verse 11. Now you know! And, spoiler alert, it involves a wizard costume, harmony, and in the end, it's revealed that... You pawned my laptop to get a hurdy-gurdy. Karen, I'm sorry but you're gonna have to remind me what a laptop is. So yeah, fun video, but uh, how does it redefine cinema or whatever you said in the title? Good question. Since this isn't an academic conference and you're definitely watching this in bed right now, I've decided to keep things a bit more interesting. So I am organizing my argument into the form of a galaxy brain meme with each new thesis increasingly out there and open to gentle ridicule if I get it wrong. So here we go. I guess there isn't really a tiny brain bad take version of my argument other than maybe YouTube videos only exist for mindless entertainment. Stop trying to think critically about culture. But honestly, I think this argument is a bit of a straw man. I mean, even those right-wing YouTubers who claim to be against all humanities scholarship still feel pretty strongly about making arguments as to why the video game Double Dragon isn't a damsel in distress trope. And even the politicians who want to defund all English departments still think we all should be reading Shakespeare. I kind of don't want to tell him how many Shakespeare scholars these days are black studies people and queer theorists. Okay, so with that out of the way, Let's get to my normal brain thesis about Have You Seen My Laptop, which is, Have You Seen My Laptop, with its delightful over-the-top weirdness, inspired people to respond in interesting ways. Have You Seen My Laptop quickly made its way to hurdy-gurdy YouTube, where this one hurdy-gurdy player felt compelled to make a reaction video. I am a folk musician and a hurdy-gurdy player, and the other day I was browsing around the YouTube, as one often does, looking for the latest hurdy-gurdy videos, and I came across a gentleman by the name of Brian David Gilbert. As you watch through Sana's reaction, it becomes clear that if Brian ever watches this video, he may have some buyer's remorse. There it is. Okay, um, the hoodie goodie he has uh, is one you can get off Etsy. It costs about a thousand euros. Um, I should probably just put it out there. If you want to learn how to play this instrument, this is generally not really a good choice. If you take it to a teacher, then the teacher is going to say no. No, you're going to have to get something else. It's also clear though that she and Brian both really love folk music and are well-versed enough in it to joke about some of its quirks. He, he does get the folk vibe is, is pretty spot on. And 12, oh god, 12 verses, that's nothing. You know, won't believe the number of ballads I've sung, you know, with the 27 verses with the main character tragically dying over the course of half the song. Also, there was one guy who transcribed the entire song onto sheet music, allowing geeks like me to make multi-track videos like this. So I granted the wizard a book forged in chrome, though it pained me to part, and regret filled my mind. With a flourish he vanished along with my tongue, leaving not but this goody behind, leaving not but this goody behind. 
But what I really want to focus on is some of the comments from Brian's original video. Some of them are really perceptive and specific. Here's an example. The Picardy thirds on antique and hurdy behind are too beautiful for subject matter. Thank you, Brian. You impress me in the weirdest of ways. Have I mentioned I love music theory nerds? Or this one. I just noticed that Karen and Brian are wearing identical shirts and undershirts at the beginning and end. Or, I'm upset nobody is talking about the shot after Brian says, a night very much like the one tonight, and it just cuts to Karen looking out the sunny window and being very confused. I would call what these commenters are doing close reading. This is the same kind of combing through details that academics do when they're preparing their arguments. Other comments on Have You Seen My Laptop belong to a genre I would call world building. Remember when Brian can't remember what a laptop is, and how he skips all the way from verse 2 to verse 11? There are a couple of fan theories in the comments that settle both of these discrepancies. Theory, Brian's ability to know what a laptop is was taken by the wizard because Brian scammed him. There's no way that Karen's Chromebook was of commensurate or greater value than the suggested retail price of that hurdy-gurdy. Okay, but hot take, Brian traded two things. One, he traded the ability to remember what a laptop is for the knowledge of how to get a hurdy-gurdy. This happened in verse 10. Two, he traded the weird metal book for the gurdy, verse 12. Or this commenter who wrote the entire rest of the song. Fans also seem to take ownership of the story, and of their sort of mythical conception of the character Brian presents in his videos. Look again at the hurdy-gurdy reaction video, where Sana, the hurdy-gurdy player, is very polite. I came across a gentleman by the name of Brian David Gilbert. But the commenters are quick to correct her. Calling Brian David Gilbert a gentleman is too nice. Call him a rapscallion, or a scoundrel. And remember when she said that Brian's hurdy-gurdy wasn't up to snuff? Some commenters interpolated that detail into the original story. It's even funnier knowing that he pawned his roommate's laptop for a bad hurdy-gurdy. I would call this last type of comment a synthesis, tying the video with outside information in an innovative way. Again. That's a technique academic writers use all the time. There's definitely some scholarly interest in the ways communities react to media, and the kinds of conversations that certain pieces of media inspire. Cinema scholar Jacqueline Stewart does what she calls reconstructive spectatorship to talk about how black Americans moving to Chicago during the Great Migration thought about movies. There's a lot to write about there. How black Americans dealt with inaccurate stereotypes of black characters on screen, how they related or didn't relate to white movie stars, and how difficult it was for them to even access movies in segregated theaters. I guess I'm interested in doing a kind of reconstructive spectatorship of YouTube video watching in 2020 and 2021. I'm interested in the kinds of conversations different YouTube videos inspire, and how we all use those conversations to create meaning from what we've just watched. Which brings me to my exploding brain thesis. Have You Seen My Laptop was partially written by its fans. I mean, once you've seen those comments about the missing 10th verse, or the wizard erasing Brian's memory, it's hard to walk away from the video without those comments impacting your view of the story. Fan communities and fan theories have existed as long as we've had media, but on YouTube they feel more powerful. I mean, YouTube comments are on the same screen as a YouTube video, it's hard to watch the video without reading the comments. I would argue that because of the layout of YouTube, you can't separate the comments from the video itself. Reading the comments is part of the viewing experience. Film theorist Dudley Andrew argues that as going to see movies in a theater becomes less and less ubiquitous, and we watch more and more movies and videos on screens like our computer or our phone, it's harder for filmmakers and distributors to dictate our viewing experience. As Andrew writes, the film phenomenon begins and ends in zones which are constitutively indeterminate. Andrew is talking about the screens we're watching on, but I think the space where film actually happens, where we actually process what we're watching, 
is inside our heads. The experience of watching a cinematic work isn't just the taking in of information, it's the processing, the thinking and feeling with it, and the attempts to make meaning. And meaning making on YouTube necessarily happens in conversation with the comments. That's why my final Galaxy Brain thesis is, when it comes to YouTube, the comments are as much a part of the cinematic work as the video itself. Remember Tom Gunning's theory, cinema of attractions, the idea that movies are basically a thrill ride for the viewer? I'd like to propose a new term for studying audiences and fandoms, cinema of conversations. Now, you may argue that Brian David Gilbert has an unusually thoughtful and dedicated fan base, and that most YouTube comment sections are really nothing more than unproductive buttholes of anger and bad faith. I get that, but I want to acknowledge the work of fan communities where creative things do happen. It's work that's understudied, completely unpaid, and virtually indispensable to the way we make meaning on YouTube. Some interesting questions may be, are there specific types of YouTube videos that lend themselves to extra creative comment sections? Maybe a video like, have you seen my laptop, with its intricate Easter eggs and missing details for people to fill in. And here's another question. If this type of fan-made creative work on YouTube is unpaid, is it exploited? This isn't about YouTube comments, but scholar Jin Ying Li writes about how Tencent, one of China's leading internet companies and film distributors, has proposed replacing professional screenwriters with crowdsourced scripts from unpaid fans for some of its major film franchises. If it's exploitable by capitalism, it must be real work, right? And lastly, for the non-academics in my audience, I hope this video helped demystify humanities academia a bit for you. If you don't like someone's ideas or you think they're wrong, you can add your own voice to the conversation. And YouTube commenters, a lot of you are doing the same kinds of close reading and informational synthesis that academics use in their arguments. Maybe I'll enroll in your Brian David Gilbert studies class one day. So I granted the wizard a book forged in chrome, though it pained me to part, and regret filled my mind. With a flourish he vanished along with my tongue, leaving not a